Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. And uh, Gabe's going to bring me the clicker because I didn't grab it. <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. So today is our last week of the Attitude of Gratitude series. And two weeks ago, Bill talked about knowing thyself. And last week, Pastor Tim talked about gratitude itself and thankfulness. And this week, we're going to talk about contentment. And I'm going to start... Um, talking about contentment by talking about a former student of mine. Now, I'm going to call her Lisa in this because I don't want to just, you know, blast her name all over the internet. Um, but Lisa, as we will call her today, was a seventh grade young lady uh, who I met about three years ago. And uh, she was, she had mental disability, she had emotional disability, and she also had a physical disability. So there was a lot working against Lisa. Um, and I'm sure all of us have gone, with, gone to school or even know now somebody in that boat. Um, somebody who just has all these things against them. And sometimes we might wonder, why would God do that to somebody? Why would they give them these disabilities? And so we worry for those people. And we think about them all the time. But at the same time, Lisa walked through school every day getting picked on by other kids her disabilities, getting picked on by even who would she would consider her friends. Uh, she had a brother who would pick on her, um, and it is very frustrating uh, for her to come into school every day. Some of the things that you would see from Lisa is she may have her food on her face after she ate. Uh, her food was commonly found on her laptop after she ate. Um, she commonly had her shirt on backwards or her shoes untied or she looked a little unkept. And these are the types of things people would pick on her for. And yet every day, every single day, Lisa would come into my classroom and every other classroom she went into with a huge smile on her face. She wouldn't be upset. She wouldn't be mad about the people who were making fun of her. She wouldn't feel as if she stuck out like a sore thumb. But instead, she was filled with joy. She was, without any other better word to describe it, content about her position in life. 100% content. And that was always so amazing to me because I would see her come in with this joy and she would say hello and she'd have this smile on her face and she did that thing when people are really happy and they would do 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 she would do that type of deal like actually verbally sing a little tune to herself <laughs> and I'd always be just amazed and I would think how is she this content well it only took about three weeks of me being her teacher for me to figure out that she was a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ and not just not just a, like I go to church on Sunday and I'm good Hey, I read the Bible every day. I bring the Bible to every one of my classes type of believer. I read the Bible in class when I finish my work type of believer. I'm a 12-year-old, but my faith is stronger than most of adults type of believer. And that was where she found her strength. That was where she found her contentment. Not in herself, but in Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to navigate us through a story in the Bible this morning that made me think of contentment. And I got, it, it was pointed to me, um, pointed out to me by the Spirit that this was the story I was to go with. And at first I thought to myself, there's no possible way this story can be about contentment. And uh, right now we're working on internet stuff, so we might not be able to see the scripture on the screen. But we're going to be in Daniel 1, 8 through 20. I am going to read that to you. Okay? And it says... Well, let me, let me take you up to this point. Nebuchadnezzar had taken Jerusalem, and he uh, asked some eunuchs to grab some young, healthy youth that he could use to serve him. Okay, And this is where we pick up. Daniel was, and his friends were some of those youth. And it says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. For why should he see 
that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age. So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them and in this manner and tested them ten days. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Yay, vegetables. <laughs> As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had an understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. So Daniel had a choice to make. Take what man has to offer, that would be what the king had to offer, and be content with that, or choose what God has called him to do and be content with that. And I think all of us face that decision every single day. Are we content with what God has called us to do, or are we taking what the earth gives us and wanting more and more and more? Was it easier for Daniel to say, hey, I only want vegetables and water? Well, of course not. He chose vegetables and water over the king's food and wine. Did he, did, what, did he do what most people would do? Probably not. But was he content with his decision? Was he content in his trust and his faith and his obedience? Yes. Did God reward him? Yes. Contentment is much more than just being thankful. It goes much deeper than that. Contentment is about faith and trust and love and hope and patience and the one who has given you something. So I looked up the word contentment, okay? And I, and I broke it down, and I was worried about getting it mixed up content with the word content, but I found out they're almost exactly the same thing. So con, the first three letters of content, means together, okay? So you think of the word connect, all right? Tent means to uh, hold, hold things. All right, so it literally means, content means to hold it together, or hold together. It means to stay strong. It means to keep your feet in the same place and not panic. That means to be content. I think of the term, hold it together, man. Okay? And I, I don't know what, that's probably from like three or four movies. I don't know exactly what movies it's from, but I've heard it before. And my dad may have said it to me before. And like grab, you, vision, you visualize somebody grabbing somebody's shoulders and shaking them. Hold it together, man. Okay? I can cycle through these real quick. There it is. Hold it together, man. Remain calm and remain content. So when you think of the word content, I want you to think of hold it together, man. And if you can imagine next time you're freaking out because something in your life is going crazy, I want you to imagine Jesus grabbing your shoulders and shaking you and going, hold it together, man. It's, it, it's kind of like, okay, fine. If Jesus is doing that, I better do it. Okay? The next question is, in what do you find your contentment? What do you run to? When you're having one of those days where you can't seem to get what you need and you're just, you're in that, like, you have that feeling in your stomach, like, gosh, I'm just not settled. What do you run to when you need something? What do you fall back on? What's your go-to? We have to think about that. And the question is, will you be a Daniel? Will you fall back on God's creation or man's temptation? Because God's creation is something that is permanent. His purpose for us is permanent. But man's temptation is temporary. 
I mean, the word temp is right at the beginning of temptation. Temporary. You can't get contentment from that. You can get it for just a moment, but it's fleeting. Daniel does some things that I found that were interesting. First of all, Daniel does what's not necessary. We have to do what is not necessary. Extra prayer, extra time in scripture, extra time alone with God. From a worldly standpoint, none of that is necessary. Counsel with a Christian friend, discipling people, none of those things from a worldly standpoint are necessary. And now we've gotten to a point where some people read scripture and make those things not necessary and try to use scripture falsely to prove that those are not necessary. All I need is to say yes to Jesus and I'm good. The rest of that is not necessary. They read one verse, take it out of context, and deem everything else not necessary. We have entire denominations that are based off not necessary. We need to be careful of this, my friends. But we must do what's not necessary. We must go the extra mile. We must do what is inconvenient. In my adult life, I have lost an enormous amount of weight three separate times. The first two times I lost an enormous amount of weight, it came back six months later. Why? Because that lifestyle was inconvenient. Going to the gym five days a week was inconvenient. Finding healthier things to eat, cooking more meals was inconvenient. And I just didn't want to deal with that. I looked for a shortcut. Oddly enough, this time, Carla and I did the Daniel fast, <laughs> which is weird. Um, that lines up really well with our scripture. Now, we didn't just have vegetables and water. Don't worry, we had fruit and nuts and things like that. For the most part, we've continued with that. We do indulge every now and then, but we're not looking for a shortcut. We're not looking for what's convenient. Proverbs 21.5 said, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. I'm not looking for a quick fix. Daniel wasn't looking for a quick fix. He was proving that God, the long-term plan, is the only fix. What we have to do is what the world won't do. That's what Daniel did. He followed God. He simply followed God. Nothing fancy, nothing extravagant. In fact, it was less fancy and less extravagant. It was vegetables and water. I've learned that following Jesus isn't simple unless you simply follow Jesus. You read those red letters, you follow what they say, you read his sermons, you read his parables. That's simple. He gives us simple instructions. You can even boil them down to the commandment and the commission if you want to. But there's more to the Christian life than just reading scripture. And I want to talk about the meaning of simplicity. You see, simplicity is a spiritual discipline. And I did quite a bit of study on the spiritual discipline of simplicity last year. And before I started studying that, I had some ideas of what simplicity meant. When I just read about it, like kind of passingly, I thought this was simplicity. Horse and carriage, no electricity, rustic living, Amish lifestyle, no mustache, just beard. <laughs> I thought that was simplicity. Maybe I thought simplicity looked like this. Halish, Halish Keller Halls. You may have seen him up here worship today. He cut his beard a little shorter. Okay, or maybe even if you go back far enough, simplicity looked like this. Caveman, gay man. <laughs> Gosh, I hope simplicity didn't look like that. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I want to encourage you to read this book if you haven't. 
This book is by Richard J. Foster. It's called Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth. This book clued me in on how to walk like Jesus every single day. It's practical, it's straightforward, and it talks about the different spiritual disciplines that we can practice as Christians. I, I highly, and I'm not getting paid for this promo, Okay, but I highly encourage you to find this book. You can find it anywhere. Most even regular bookstores have this book. Very high selling book. I encourage you to get a copy of that. There's a Japanese proverb that says, and this, is, this pointed to simplicity to me. You can have a thousand mats in a room, but you can only sleep on one. So you can have all these things, but you have to choose one. Are you going to sleep on the mat that represents God? So let's talk about this simplicity thing. Simplicity, like I said, doesn't mean carriages or no electricity. Not that there's not merit to these things. Not that they can't help with simplicity. But that's not what it means. Simplicity simply means putting God first in everything you do. Everything you do, putting God first. Looking at everything through a God filter. That's what simplicity means. Why is that, Daniel? Because that's exactly what he did. He said, okay, if I make this decision, it needs to be about God. Have I been led to this decision? Has God told me to follow through with this? Have I prayed about this? So instead of just inserting his own opinion, he makes sure he's looking through God's eyes. Even David, even King David, it says in Psalm 23, 1, famous verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's put that together. Since the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want anything else but him. And only through him can I get what I truly Desire? Can I truly be content? Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first, not seek second or third or after you get something else done. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. This is the beginning of the road to contentment. To true content is to put God first in everything and see it simply. I was given a, a slide to make when I was taking the journey to talk about contentment. And it sounded weird to me, anticipating contentment. I had no idea what that meant. I couldn't figure it out. And so I, I really sat and thought about that for quite a while. And I thought about simplicity and how it leads to contentment. But then I thought about all the times where I was in a storm, where there were things going on I didn't understand, where there were conversations I had to have that were tearing me apart inside, where things in, where there, things in my life had fallen apart. My mom got COVID. My, our town got ripped apart by a storm. Our, our lead pastor is, is going away. All these things are happening. How can I find contentment in that? But it's not just about finding contentment. It's about having contentment and trust in what God's going to do next. See, hope and trust and patience lead to anticipated contentment. What is God's purpose for me in this trial I'm going through right now? This tension that's in my life right now has to have a godly purpose. And if I'm seeking God first, I believe that. And I trust that he's going to take me somewhere great. So I'm content, not with my situation, but with the fact that God is doing something with my situation. Do you believe this? Because if you believe this, you are anticipating contentment. That he has a hope and a future for us, a purpose for our lives. Anticipate that he's going to take us there and be ready for that. 
not ready for the fall, but if you believe in Jesus Christ, ready for you to rise up through him. What we have to be careful of is that we have to realize that contentment does not always mean you're going to be comfortable. Comfort can be a tool of the enemy. And I think we have to recognize that. Apathy gets led to by comfort. That attitude, like we don't have to do anything, it has nothing to do with us. We have to live in holy tension. Think of all the times in the Bible when somebody had to wait for God to act. Think about David. Think about Paul. Think about Moses. He didn't get his, his contentment until he got to heaven. His fault, but hey. How many of you are musicians? Raise your hand if you're a musician. So some of you who are musicians who are, have been musicians, and even those of you who are not musicians, if you listen to music, you know what this is. Near the end of a song, they play a note or a chord, and it just sits. And it's like you're waiting for it to go somewhere else. You can't wait for it to get there. And then finally, it resolves. Okay, that's called resolving in music, a resolution. And you're like, ah. The question is, can you be content before it does that? Because you trust that God will resolve it. That's the holy tension we need to live in. When we put him first, he will resolve that tension, and we can be content knowing that he's going to do that. When we seek him first, when we live in simplicity, we can live in contentment. Priscilla Schreier has a quote, commit to doing what is right in front of you now with faithful simplicity, confident that this is the pace of God's will for your life today. Trust him for tomorrow. Listen to him for today in obedience. Seek him first. I was watching a sermon on contentment. Yeah, pastors do that. We steal stuff from other pastors. This is what happens. <laughs> Um, I watched quite a few this week and listened to quite a few, and I didn't have this slide. I wanted this to be a nice positive message about being content with God's call for you, but I was given a warning. There are some things in this life, in our Christian walk, that we cannot be content with. And we have to be careful, because there are some things that may seem good, that are getting us stuck in the mud. Let me tell you right now that being saved is not enough. And that's going to sound weird. But there's a lot of people who say, ah, I've accepted Jesus into my heart. I'm done. I'll just come to church every Sunday. Good to go. Paul Washer, pastor, um, at a church in Arizona, says, how many believe they are going to heaven not because they trust in Christ, but because they trust in the sincerity of a decision they made a long time ago? Is that decision all you have to lay your Christian hat on? Do you serve? No. Do you read your Bible Monday through Saturday? No. Do you read your Bible after 11.30 a.m. on Sunday? No. No. Do you disciple others? No. Do you talk about your faith? No. Do you talk to anybody? No. But I accepted Christ when I was 19. How many people believe that's all? That's all there is. Oops. Sunday is not enough. How many people come to church on Sunday to feel closer to Jesus because they know they felt closer to Satan Monday through Saturday? Some of us in this room may be able to raise our hands. Just coming to church on Sunday is not enough. And nowhere in the Bible does it say, if you go to church on Sunday, you're going to heaven. That's not scriptural. That's not truth. Enjoying your own faith is not enough. Boy, it'd be great if it was, if you could just say, hey, I'm saved. 
these other people, that's on them. We get so caught up in our own personal salvation that we forget that the Great Commission tells us to go baptize others and teach others in his name. What about your neighbor who doesn't know Christ? What about your kids who don't know Christ? What about your parents who don't know Christ? Your cousins, your neighbors, your brothers, just the strangers on the street that don't know Jesus. It's not enough. If you or others around you still live a sinful life and yet proclaim to be Christian, then Satan is content with that. He's definitely okay with that. He wants you to be content with where you're at and stay there and don't grow and don't move and don't practice spiritual disciplines and don't live in simplicity. True gratitude is when you're never content in repayment of the gift given you. You are always working to repay the grace that Jesus Christ has given you for your entire life, for all of eternity. You're all, always working to pay that back. That is gratitude. Not a fleeting moment. Not yesterday. Not what you will do tomorrow. Right now, always. Trying to work to pay that back. However you are called to do that. Now I'm going to give us some action steps. And uh, the first word of the, the first action step, I'm going to duck in case anybody throws shoes at me. I am well aware that Thanksgiving is on Thursday, and this first word is almost like a Thanksgiving bad word. Fast. Ah. <laughs> Fast from something earthly and unhealthy between now and Christmas. That doesn't have to be food. If it is, good for you. If it's turkey, that's awesome. <laughs> Save a bird. But what I mean is this, is there something that is separating you from, from the simplicity of Jesus Christ? Is there something that, that is pushing Jesus out of the way? Maybe you're reading your scripture and like, well, I'm going to hurry up and get my devotion done today because I want to do this. The this that you just talked about, you need to fast from that. Now, I, of course, can't tell you what's on your heart and what you know you should give up so that God is first in your life so you can truly find contentment. But church, I want us to try to fast from something between now and Christmas that is separating us from the glory and grace of Jesus Christ. In that same time frame, add in something godly. You know that do what's not necessary that Daniel did? Maybe it's time for you to do something that the world sees as not necessary. Maybe that's extra time in prayer. Maybe that's extra small group time together. Maybe it's calling that friend that you had it out with and reconnecting. I don't know what your extra is. I don't know what you need to add. But obviously we could all use more Jesus Christ in our lives. And that is how we get to be content with more Jesus Christ and emptying out ourselves to him. We're going to do a special prayer this morning because there are some children around this world who are going to find some contentment in the simplest things that are sent to them by Operation Christmas Child. These are simple things. There's no cell phone. There's no tablet. There's probably no Wi-Fi. And yet when they open this box, they're going to have tears in their eyes and smiles on their faces, and they're going to give the credit to Jesus Christ. And that is special. That is contentment. And so I'm going to pray over this box and pray for us and then we're going to move into announcements of Pastor Bill. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the time today. We thank you for everything you've done for us. Lord, we have this tendency to put ourselves before everybody else and anything else. Daniel didn't do that. 
He put you first. He put himself aside, and it got him victory. So, Lord, we ask that as children around the world receive these gifts from people who have packed them, as we receive your gifts that have been packed for us, that we embody you, that everything we do goes through you, that we see you first. Lord, I pray that the children that receive these boxes see your spirit through these gifts. And through these material things, you work on their hearts. Through the word that is contained in these boxes, they're able to learn about you. And that your word spreads throughout this world and sweeps this planet with love. Thank you, Lord, for this time together this morning. And we just pray that you bless our week this week and help us have a safe and happy Thanksgiving, remembering to be gracious to others, be filled with gratitude for what you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.